gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, just thankful, grateful for the opportunity that you've given us once again to take and feast upon your word. I just ask that you would strip away all foolishness, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Well, as you can maybe uh, see from the video, it's a little cold and windy and blustery here in southeast Oklahoma. But that's usually how it is. If you don't like the weather, just stick around and it'll change. We've been studying together in the epistle to the Romans verse by verse, and in every new study, it's it's kind of like we're kids opening our presents on Christmas morning. The marvelous truth that we've been justified freely by His grace, justified without a cause, based on no merit whatsoever in us, but on the finished work of Jesus Christ. As a result of that, we were told that we're not under law, that sin will not have dominion over us. But then we find a great conflict between flesh and spirit. The seventh chapter ended with wretched man that I am who shall deliver me from the body of this death. And we're told, thank God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And now and again, every time I'm branded as a heretic or, or a cult leader or, you know, some kind of Jim Jones, for giving God all the glory and none to ourselves, I receive another blessing on top of that. I've said this many times before, I'll say it again. I don't really care about the number of followers, nor do I care if you agree with me on anything I teach, which I believe today has largely been abandoned. I'm comfortable in my own bare feet and I'm more than ready in fact, I'm anxious to stand before God and give an account for my life and this ministry. You precious souls do not need to be entertained by nonsense, nor do you need your ears tickled. I believe time is short, and precious souls for whom Christ died is my concern here. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. So I'm hated, yet I'm blessed to declare unto you this day that God did not wait upon a dead man's decision to quicken you to life, just as he raised many from the grave to life, just as God breathed the breath of life into Adam's nostrils. He breathes the breath of life into us by his Holy Spirit. As we enter into the New Testament, we see this truth quickly introduced in Romans 1 through 2. It travels all the way through to Revelation like a golden thread woven throughout the Word. But more than that, a seed is alive when planted where it then dies so that it might bring forth fruit of its own kind. So we see this law at work beneath our feet and we also see it on a grander scale. We see this life out of death principle in the great expanse of our universe. Even a dying star, a white dwarf, dies and gives birth. Its final collapse generates a violent explosion blowing the fragments of that star out into space where that those fragments mix with hydrogen and other stars are formed. God left, he left us folks with no excuse. The idea that you or I did something to be born is as ridiculous a notion as anything anyone ever came up with, and yet this is the capstone, the cornerstone belief of modern Christianity. The truth is that you have been lied to, you've been tricked, you've been deceived, fooled, bamboozled into believing a lie. All right, I'm through ranting, so that being said, victory is what we're now looking at in the 8th chapter. And we will find as we go on 
that the body of that death includes even the creation as well. Verse 1, no condemnation. Verse 2, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, something I talked about in my last video, something totally separate and distinct from law. It is not the law principle, but the life principle. The law condemns, the spirit gives life. Our Lord himself said as much to those who had ears to hear. It is the spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life, John 6, 63. So we see Paul confirming our Lord's own words in John. No surprise, the Holy Spirit is the author. We saw the Holy Spirit going to great lengths in the first 15 verses or more to make this contrast between the old man and the new man. Verse 3, we are looking at sanctification, our walk, our spiritual growth. Growth in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. The law couldn't do it. It finds the flesh to be weak. It was at the cross, keep in mind that's where it all began, that our sinful flesh was condemned, crucified with Christ. Christ was made to be sin for us, and through the cross, God condemned sin in the flesh, His and ours as well. Not that He was with sin, because He was not. He was the sinless Son of God, God of very God, sent by the Father in the likeness of sinful flesh. But as it concerns us, the flesh will always remain just that, the flesh, which profits nothing. Verse 4 reveals the purpose that the righteousness of God may be fulfilled in us. Folks, we have no righteousness in and of ourselves. All righteousness is of the Lord. Our righteousness is are as filthy rags Isaiah 64 6 the word in the original Hebrew text that the Holy Spirit elected to use to describe this filthy unclean garment is interesting it's ta may in the Hebrew it's the garment of a woman who was unclean righteousness of God must come through a source other than us and that is its original source, which is God. This shouldn't come as any surprise. It's plain, simple, straightforward language that the text uses. The phrase, the righteousness of God. It is the Holy Spirit who bears witness with our spirit concerning these truths and more. He bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. I, I spoke a little bit about this in the previous video. We are God's children by birth. He not only chose us, but we were born by the will of God, John 1, 13, and we were born from above, and we are His from before the foundation of the world. We were His, and we have always been under the auspices of, of His grace and of His loving care. So we left off at verse 16. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are, in fact, children of God. That witness being the Word of God, not emotions. And we are now up to verse 17 in our study of this marvelous chapter where grace continues to reign unto life. Since we're children... It's a first-class condition in the Greek. Since we are God's children, then we're heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so, be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. There's no question about us being God's, God's sons. We are called His sons, and we are called His children. Verse 15, we've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The keystone passage of Scripture on adoption is in the 23rd verse of this chapter, and we'll look at it more when we get there. 
Adoption is the eschatological truth that our bodies are not to be destroyed, but in fact redeemed. And we'll have a new body, not just a spirit. It's the eschatological significance of adoption that has, has often been overlooked. Eschatology is the study of last things. We're His children. We know that because we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we were born by the will of God, that we were born from above, that we have always been His. There are Christians who believe that we were Satan's children and adoption was the process whereby we as Satan's children were adopted into God's family. And I absolutely insist that you cannot find a scriptural basis for that. How precious, how powerful, and, and how wonderful this book is. We had a brother named Tyndale who was strangled and then burned at the stake by Catholicism so that you could hold that English translation of Scripture in your hands. We can play fast and loose, folks, with this book, and, and neither should we condition our lives on personal opinions, but on biblical truth, biblical fact, doctrine. There is no passage of Scripture that will lead you to believe that you were ever Satan's child. And I know somebody is going to jump up and say, well, you don't understand. Ephesians, you know, we were all children of wrath, even as others. Children of wrath is not children of Satan. It isn't that God's wrath was ignored. He, he did deal with sin in Jesus Christ. If the penalty was not completely paid in Christ, then the penalty wasn't paid at all. So let's be careful we don't reduce the work of Christ to not zero, as the Holy Spirit says in Corinthians. You know, we're willing to sing Jesus paid it all, but hordes of Christians don't believe that. Don't real, not really. He didn't really pay it all. He started it. We got to finish it. Jesus is the author and finisher of your faith. We are children of God's, and we are children of promise. We're God's children, and if we're God's children, then we're heirs. We're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. There's a difference between an heir and a joint heir. We're an heir of God, but we are a joint heir of Christ. My wife was an heir many years ago. We received news that an aunt of hers had died and left a reasonable sum of money. And so the courts undertook to find all of the heirs, and I think she, she got $5.29 or something like that. She was not a joint heir. She was an heir. And all of the money that particular relative had, it was divided even, evenly among all the heirs. But we are joint heirs with Christ. That means everything that Christ gets, we get. It's not that we're splitting a pie. We get the whole pie. Everything that Christ inherits, we inherit. We're an heir of God. That means that we're the recipients of all that God has promised. And all that God has promised has been promised through Jesus Christ. And so we are a joint heir with Christ. And everything that comes to Christ comes to us. We're actually seeing a glimpse of that right now. We've seen that as we've gone through these studies. We're seeing a glimpse right now of these marvelous uh, truths of grace. I, I don't believe those blessings can be counted this side of glory. That They're so great. Blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. Ephesians 1.3 We are joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. Now folks, it is absolutely imperative that you understand this is not a normal conditional clause in the Greek. It is not conditional. And it's astounding what people have built out of this passage of Scripture. We're joint heirs with Christ if we suffer with Him. And all of those who don't suffer with Him, they're not joint heirs. 
So the way you become a joint heir with Christ is not anything that God did, not anything that Christ did. It's, it's whether or not you choose, you decide, you elect to suffer for him. And down through the years, there have been people who call themselves Christian who have forced all kinds of suffering upon this verse. That has nothing to do with this passage of Scripture. If you have the authorized version, which is the version that, that I'm studying from, I'm not purporting that version. I mentioned to many people, there are things I like about it, there are things I don't like about it. Mine says, if so be that we suffer with them, and those three words, if so be, are the translation of one Greek word, I pair, I pair. The first time we saw uh, the Greek word I pair was in verse 9 of this chapter. It only occur occurs six times in the entire New Testament. And the first time we saw it was in verse 9. You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. I'd probably translate it because. Because you were not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, because the Spirit of God dwells in you. There's no question about whether it dwells in you or not. The translation, and, and that is what it is, if so be, leads us to believe that this may or may not be true, and, and actually it, it depends on you. But actually the truth is not in question in the Greek word I pair. The second occurrence is in our verse, and if children, then heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ, if so be, that we suffer with him, that we may, may be also glorified together. I translate that because we suffer with him, or since we suffer with him. Some translators, in fact, they've done that in the authorized version, have translated it seeing, and they see in that word since or because, because in verse 9, you're not in the flesh but in the spirit, seeing the spirit of God dwells in you. Or in verse 17, your joint heirs with Christ, seeing that we suffer with him. 1 Corinthians 8, 5, there's our word, I pair again. For though there be that which are called gods, or because there will be that which are called gods. And so our, our present text says, and if children, and that's a first class condition in the Greek, and, and if children, and you are, the heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, so that all that God has promised we get. We're heirs of God and we're joint heirs with Christ. It isn't that we share with Christ. We get what Christ gets, seeing that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. This is not personally accepted suffering, is, is my point. This is not some personal decision to give your life to Christ or to give up a million dollar a day job to go to the mission field and work for a dollar a day. The whole body suffers. You can't say that when your wrist is broken like mine was when my horse went down on top of me all 1,100 pounds, rear, he reared up and came down on top of me and shattered four bones in my wrist to dust. You, you can't say that, that when something like that happens that the only thing that hurts is the wrist. You've got the mind involved and the throbbing and, and who knows what else. The whole body suffers. That's the kind of suffering that's involved here. It's a suffering you don't have any choice in. It's a suffering that accrues to you because you're a member of the body of Christ. And we are told in Corinthians if one part of the body suffers, the whole body suffers with it. That's the concept here. This isn't some kind of a personal decision. I'm going to suffer for Christ. And yet this passage is used many times for that kind of a drive to get Christians to give more than they ought to give or to serve more than they ought to serve or, or who knows what. This is just suffering that comes to you separate from your choice or your activity. It comes to you because you are a member of the body of Christ and one, and one member suffers. When, when one member suffers, one part suffers, it all suffers. 
There's no maybe you'll suffer and maybe you won't. As a member of the body of Christ, you're filling up the sufferings of Christ. Colossians 1.24 Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh. I do my share on behalf of His body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. So you may be suffering for Christ completely in a different way in the years ahead. I, I don't know. I, I just want you to know that there's no doubt of suffering in verse 17, and there's no personal choice of it. It isn't you who decided that, you know, I'm going to be different than most Christians. I'm going to suffer for Christ. No, no. You're a joint heir with Christ. Since we are members of His body, therefore as members of His body, we suffer with Him. That's the suffering that's involved here. Verse 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Oh, if we could just grasp that word reckon. We saw it in Romans chapter 6. Reckon yourselves dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. I've mentioned this before, how many times Christians have said to me, well, I tried that, and, and the minute that they say that, I know they don't understand the word legizomai, reckon. The word means count it as true. It means look at the facts. Two plus two is four, at, at least in normal mathematical realms. And whether you think it's five, twenty, or a hundred won't make any difference. The truth is, is the truth and what the word reckon says is logically consider the evidence and reach a conclusion that's that's basically what legizomai means two plus two is four reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin you're looking at the facts how do you know those facts how, how do you know that you're dead because god says so what more do you want you are dead indeed unto sin because God said so. I reckon, I look at the facts that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The glory that shall be revealed in us is tied intimately to the fact that we're joint heirs with Christ. And clearly, this is an eschatological passage. It's looking forward to that glory which shall be revealed in us. The word time there, this present time, that's kairos, by the way, in the Greek, kairos. There's the word chronos, time, from which we get chronology, but that's not this word. This word is kairos. The word refers to things coming to a head, to take full advantage of the suitable time, the right moment. My times are in his hands. He lights my candle. He bottles my tears. He knows the way I take. And when he has tested me, I absolutely will come forth as gold. He's promised never to leave me nor forsake me. If people could grasp the wonder of what Christ said, consider the lilies of the field, how that they grow. Just stop right there. The lily, folks, didn't plant itself. It didn't feed itself. They toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon, in all of his glory, wasn't arrayed like one of these. Dearly beloved, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow was cast into the oven or eaten by a horse, Shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, or wherewithal ye shall be clothed, for after all these things do the heathen seek. But your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and whose righteousness? His righteousness. The righteousness of him, says the original text and all these things will be added unto you a favorite passage of mine has always been in Habakkuk 3 although the fig tree shall not blossom neither shall fruit be in the vines 
the labor of the olive oil shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. Well, I'm out of time. I love you all. I truly do. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.